Half an hour away from the open in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne. Here's our top stories this morning. Asian shares followed declines on Wall Street after the latest U.S. PPI prices weaken the case for imminent Fed rate cuts. China's one-year MLF rate due this hour with most economists expecting a hold even as the economy remains under pressure and market sentiment fragile. And we're going to hear exclusively from the U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, about the bill to ban TikTok talk and curbing Beijing's access to high-tech chips. The People's Liberation Army will take advantage of that technology to strengthen itself at the expense of the American military. We're not going to do that. We're not going to compromise on national security and we're not going to negotiate. Happy Friday. We made it here. Take a look at the price action here this morning. We continue to see a bit of a downbeat story when it comes to risk appetite this morning. That PPI prices that we got out of the U.S. certainly sort of solidified the hot CPI print that we got just a few days ago. So certainly that's what we're seeing a lot when it comes to the bond market here today. And we are seeing that sell-off cross Asia fixed income. When you have the U.S. 10-year yield basically rising as much as 10 basis points, the biggest one-day move in a month. Uh, and then we're watching very close to that yen, right? So we're, we're expected to hear that Rengo, uh, the wage talks, and the final outcomes that came out of these spring negotiations here. So very much watching what happens with yen. We're at 148.46 here right now. So certainly uh, a little bit of weakness, although we did get that slight boost earlier on another report about the BOJ maybe ending negative rates next week as well. So U.S. futures are flat. Asia's a bit on the back foot, and the dollar is catching a bid here this morning. And most of the equity market are slightly in the red. You take a look at how things are looking with the Nasdaq Gold and Dragon. That's where we saw quite a bit of downside yesterday. We're down close to 3% in the ADRs. And this is how the China futures are set up here. So we're watching, of course, the CSI 300, this winning streak that we've seen, uh, a set to gain weekly gain of five weeks in a row. That's the longest streak that we've seen, actually, uh, for some time now. We're watching those Han High earnings as well. Take a look at that. The stock popping there after AI hardware sales. That certainly did offset some of the weakness, or at least what we've been seeing, the challenges around Apple and iPhone sales. So that's certainly one to watch. China futures are looking like this here right now. So uh, we're, we'll talk a bit more about the national team. Seems like they're stepping back a bit uh, uh, recently. But foreign investors are also coming back. In, in a marginal way as well. So maybe enough of a buffer there to really keep this equity market going. Futures are flat, slightly lower here, I should say, for A50 futures here. And we're at 235 from this Chinese 10-year year. We're watching that one-year MLF. It looks like they could be on hold. Blue Economics says, hey, they could cut and they should cut here right now. 720.39 for your dollar China here this morning. This is what the agenda is set up here today looking like. We talked about the MLF a little bit later on. We have data from home prices, new end use coming out at the bottom of this hour. We'll see any signs, if any, of any turnaround uh, when it comes to property sales. Uh, we're talking about the financing support, foreign inflows. We talked a little bit more about that just now. Pharma stocks have been pretty hot, just given some of the push for innovation and the like from policymakers in Beijing. And CATL earnings coming out. We got May 2 as well, uh, still focusing on the earnings season there. But there you go, there's the Han High shares up some 5% with Taiwan opening here in the last few seconds. Well, okay, let's talk about that one-year MLF. That's the next thing to watch here. Now, you take a look at where things are, right? So consensus seems to be for a hold. Why? Well, of course, we just had that triple R cut not too long ago. There's also some concerns about the banks, right? If we see rates heading further, are we going to see more of that NIMS compression here uh, and really going to make it difficult for those lenders? So for the most part, some are thinking stand pat at 2.5%. This is what the, the breakdown is in terms of what people are expecting here. A whole that seems to be taking the majority of the votes here right now. Uh, but Bloomberg Economics is still one of the four that is forecasting for a 10 basis point cut. Why, they say? Well, yes, you think about all those concerns about banks, the renminbi, the like, yes, that's valid. But they believe with the, the boost that we got from that triple R cut, uh, it certainly means they, they need to continue to increase that impact with maybe a MLF cut here today and lead banks to extend more and cheaper credit. It's interesting, they said, right now the priority should be about fighting deflation uh, more than anything. So 
Well, watch out for that one. Obviously, we're still focusing on geopolitics here as we wrap up this week. U.S. Democratic and Republican senators are resisting calls to fast track the passage of a bill that would force TikTok's Chinese owner to sell the app. Now, the bill passed by the House this week demands ByteDance divest within six months or shut down the platform. Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal says the deadline is too short. And Republican Ted Cruz wants a review that could tie it up for months. So this could be a lengthy process here. However, the Senate Intelligence Committee chair told us he supports expediting the bill. They're collecting enormous amount of personal data about Americans. The genius of TikTok, it kind of knows what you like even before you may know. And that kind of personal data of the 170 million Americans who are on 90 minutes a day, if you don't think that is a security risk or potentially you could be blackmailed at some future time um, uh, by agents of the Chinese government, then I think you don't understand the unfortunate real world that we live in. Meanwhile, the top U.S. diplomat to China has hit out against Beijing's objections to a possible TikTok ban. Ambassador Nicholas Burns spoke exclusively with our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. We've heard a number of complaints from the government here in Beijing this week about uh, the American debate on TikTok. I find it supremely ironic because government officials here are using the X platform to criticize the United States. They don't give their own citizens the right to use X, to use Instagram, to use Facebook, to have access to Google. And so uh, it is ironic indeed that the government here is complaining about a process when they shut down access for 1.4 billion Chinese to all these uh, platforms. Every country has a duty and responsibility to protect its national security. And what the president has done over the last year and a half is to make it impossible uh, for sensitive American technology, advanced semiconductors for AI purposes to be sold to China because we know it will happen. We know that the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, will take advantage of that technology to strengthen itself at the expense of the American military. We're not going to do that. We're not going to compromise on national security. And we're not going to negotiate. And you can bet that the, that the government here in Beijing is taking similar measures. They have not allowed, for most of the last 20 years, the export of core, sensitive national security applied Chinese technology to the United States. And so, you know, every, every government, and certainly our government, has a right to take these decisive steps, and that's what we're doing. I also talked to a lot of businesses, and we all know about the FDI numbers, foreign direct investment, uh, down to the lowest gain since 1993. There is hesitation, not only because of the economy is weak, but also because of the myriad of different national security and the opacity of such policy, especially coming out of the National People's Congress, we didn't get a lot of clarity on policy. We do know, and you were in that uh, 60 Minutes interview where you did talk about U.S. companies such as Bain and Company, Mints, and others who have seen raids and they've seen uh, arrests of U.S. citizens. Can you, can you elaborate on the threat and the pall that has been cast over the investment community and doing business, Americans doing business in China at this time? I think this is a question central to the U.S.-China relationship for the next year and, and the year beyond. Uh, we have a $575 billion two-way trade relationship. China is the third largest trade partner of the United States. There are thousands of American companies doing business here. Here's the problem. They're hearing conflicting signals. Some senior Chinese government officials say private sector investment is welcome in China. Your investment will be protected. But then these companies are also hearing a different message, whether it's the raids against American companies of last March and April, whether it is the opacity of the um, counterespionage law, where espionage is defined in such a general way that normal activities in any other country of the world, the collection of data, could be construed as espionage. And so we see American firms backing away, or at least being very cautious about investing a lot of money here, because they're not sure where the lines are. And I think the voices that they're hearing from the government here in China about national security, they're the strongest and loudest voices right now. U.S. Ambassador to China Nicholas Burns there speaking with our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel. And we are going to be hearing more from that extensive interview with Steve coming up throughout the next two hours or so. Meanwhile, we're hearing a lot more talks when it comes to TikTok. 
who potentially could buy it if, in fact, this ban goes through. Steven Mnuchin says he's spoken to potential co-investors about buying the company from its Chinese parent company. The former U.S. Treasury Secretary made the comment to CNBC but declined to give specifics. Mnuchin runs a private investment firm that counts Saudi Arabia among its backers, and Bloomberg Intelligence estimates TikTok's U.S. business would be worth up to $40 billion. I think the legislation should pass, and I, I think it should be sold. I understand the technology. It's a great business, and I'm going to put together a group to buy TikTok. You're trying to buy TikTok. I am, because this should be owned by U.S. U.S. businesses. There's no way that the Chinese would ever let a U.S. company own something like this in China. All right, so we'll watch that space very closely, of course, and what goes on in the Senate. But certainly we're watching some other tech-related stocks here this morning. Samsung, that stock certainly is seeing quite a bit of movement here. Uh, we have a Bloomberg scoop coming out that just came out saying that the U.S. plans to award more than $6 billion to Samsung Electronics and really helping the chipmaker expand beyond just that project in Texas that has already been announced. Uh, we are seeing the stock down some one percent. TSMC watching these chip plays very closely, but Han Hai, that's the outperformer among that pack here today, on the back of those earnings at eight percent pop here, just about ten minutes into the session or so. All right, we're going to be taking a deep dive, of course, into not just tech, but also U.S.-China relations. Later on in our show, we have the East China Normal University and why they think a TikTok ban unrealistic, according to Joseph Gregory Mahoney. He joins us a little bit later on. But first, we're going to hear from Tsinghua University as we look ahead to the PBOC's MLF decision due in the next few minutes. Ju Ning joining us next. We're counting down the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Looks like right now, risk sentiment not too great uh, when it comes to greater uh, this region. But uh, A50 futures, yeah, slightly negative on this gloomy Hong Kong Friday morning. This is The China Show. Good morning. All right, here's your setup to the China Open here today. Looks like we're seeing some downside when it comes to A50 futures, down about a fifth of 1%, fifth, five tenths of 1%, I should say. But really, we are on track for a fifth straight week of gains when it comes to onshore equities. We've talked about foreign inflows are coming back, set to be a second straight month uh, of really inflows. And southbound continues to be quite strong as well. 720 for your dollar China here this morning. We're, of course, counting down just about six minutes away from that one-year MLF rate. Let's bring in our next guest, Professor Zhu Ning, Deputy Dean at the National Institute of Financial Research at Tsinghua University. How do you, how do you see monetary policy playing out in, in the next few months or so? Of course, obviously, we had that ambitious growth target of 5% announced at NPC. Is monetary going to be key to delivering that, you think, Zhu Ning? I think it's definitely an important ingredient of the, all the policy boxes that we're going to have coming out of the Chinese government. But I don't think the monetary policy will be taking the front seat in uh, setting the pace for either the economic growth or for uh, helping with the uh, stabilization, stabilization of the, the, the financial sector. I think the NDRC apparently is taking more and more of the, the, the dominant role in setting I mean, industrial policy, in setting the major tones of economic policies these days. I was going to ask you about the, the balance sheet of the central bank. They added 5 trillion yuan of assets recently, um, which is qu the quickest build that we've seen in a decade. H how much do you think this sort of expansion could actually lift growth in China? It certainly helps. I mean, I think just like what uh, the Western central banks have been doing over COVID, I think an accommodative or more easing attitudes towards the monetary policy is not only providing the much needed liquidity to the economy, but also improving the expectation of the overall environment. Uh, I think, but the one thing we have to keep in mind is, I think the monetary multiply, so to speak. So how much of the money that uh, the central bank has put into the system is really going to generate additional demand or additional uh, usage of its uh, of its space? So I think in the past, real estate has been a very important sort of multiplier in the developers will get the money and uh, take the loan, uh, buy the land, and then use the land as a collateral and then make, make another round of investment. But with the weakening of the real estate sector, or actually the, the pretty much inactivity in the real estate sector, I mean, I think that one has to discount to a certain extent how much that five trillion will eventually be helpful mm. in uh, generating the total demand or aggregate demand. 
some people will look at a number like that and they're saying, oh, it, this is, looks like a Western style QE. C can we call it that? I, I think that this, the, the PPOC would rather you not call it that, but I think in essence, uh, we really do not have a lot of uh, new ideas out of modern monetary theory or the monetary theory in general. So in a way, when you are facing a slowdown in the economy, more accommodating monetary policy is necessary. So whether it is taking the form of uh, interest rate cut or in, in the form of just uh, generating a, a bigger balance sheet, I think that is just the choice of uh, different poss possibilities in the toolbox. And you mentioned about the property sector woes and the like. I mean, how important do you think consumption is going to be for the economy this year versus previous years? And, and, and you know, what, and what are your expectations on the lift that con consumption can have on the economy for 2024? Well, I think it's critical. I have been saying this for a long time. I think consumption will have to be the only driving force to lift China from the high middle income class country to a high income uh, country. So in a way that uh, I, th I think a consumption is really not only important, but also probably the only driving force for China going in the coming decades. And this year, I think, I mean, there are a couple of brighter spots and there are uh, some uncertainties. For the bright spots, we can see that the, the food traffic is really improving. So I think that is showing uh, increasing economic activities. And also we're seeing that, well, things are stabilizing and people are having uh, far more uh, visibility with, well, what is the new norm going to look like? So I think that's going to be helpful somewhat. The downside is I think we're mm. all also seeing that people are traveling more, but then they're actually per capita or per trip spending less. So I think this is somewhat uh, consistent with my uh, observation. I think the younger generation, unlike the previous generation who need certain kind of stimulation to consume, they're already quite uh, active with their consumption. And the fact that we're seeing they're slowing down their consumption or not growing their consumption is larger because I think they're really reaching the point of their uh, uh, income or disposable income. So I think that in the end, the growth in disposable income is eventually going to be the determining factor for how uh, consumption is going to shape up in the coming years. Yeah, this is a good, good point that you think, you know, the young are still quite active when it comes to spending, but why do you think household savings are so sticky? That is it just a concept of, of Chinese people are, are frugal in, in some ways? Um, and and is, is cash handouts, as some have you know, really debated about, is that gonna be the answer to really getting people to spend again? I, mean, I do a lot of research in behavioral finance in which we really study people's uh, fear and greed. And I think it's really the, the fear. I mean, uh, first of all, the fear from COVID or the aftermath of that, and then the fear of the uncertainty in the economic environment. And I think in the previous year or so, the fear in the falling housing prices and the falling stock prices, which really don't I mean, make the households wonder where can they put their money without having to suffer a loss. Hence, they are willing to put a more and more money into the safest option that they can think of, which is the savings account. Okay, um, good point there. I'm, I'm just wondering, in terms of what we heard from from the MPC, there's been a big push when it comes to industrial policy, right? New productive forces and the like. I'm just wondering, just given what we've been seeing, uh, when, hold on a second, we have some breaking news tuning. Uh, we are watching that PBOC uh, one-year MLF rate. So, okay, unchanged at 2.5%. So uh, this is basically what people were expecting, uh, but they are withdrawing a net 94 billion RMB through that MLF. All right, let's, let's move on. I'll, I'm going to get to tuning a little bit more on this, what we were just talking about, which is about new productive forces, industrial policy. It's interesting, though, that we continue to hear this sort of aggressive push towards high tech you know, manufacturing, innovation, the like, but we're, we're facing quite a bit of overcapacity, right? And tensions with the US, with Europe as well. Do you, do you think that policymakers need to sort of adjust their industrial policy to address some of these concerns out there? Well, I, th I think it's, instead of adjusting, I think the policymakers are actually doubling down on the industrial policy in a way that well, we're, we're seeing some kind of industrial policy coming out of the U.S. or Europe. So that's giving some confidence or justification for China is thinking even harder on how to utilize the, the industrial policy to uh, better itself in the competition in key technologies. So I, I, I think that's probably one key a message coming out of the uh, the two sessions this year about I think China is actually continuing, if not uh, uh, 
increasing its emphasis on the, the industry policy and the, the so-called new uh, quality productive for, forces. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering in terms of what we just heard from this MLF, right? So it's unchanged. They reframe from a net cash injection for the first time since November 2022. What do you think are some of the reasons driving this? Is, is there really a, a concern about the currency in some ways, uh, as well as what we've been seeing when it comes to banks and, and their margins, if we continue to see more rate cuts in the pipeline? Are those sort of big factors that the PBOC and policymakers are really thinking about now? Yeah, I, I, think, I think I've been commenting on this uh, for, for some time. I think that the PBOC is somewhat in a delicate balance. On one hand, it needs to be more accommodative with the economy. But on the other hand, it has to be very watchful with uh, how the uh, foreign exchange rate goes. I think it's giving uh, the PBOC some breathing room or some uh, sweet spot uh, in the next few months with the Fed uh, plan to uh, cut interest rate. I think that's, uh, that's going to give uh, China's central bank a greater room to maneuver uh, in the next few months. So I think it's, it's going to be more active in playing this balancing game between growth and um, stabilization of the uh, RMB exchange rate. Juning, have a great weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. Deputy Dean of National Institute of Financial Research at Tsinghua University. I uh, just want to recap, of course, that PBOC, uh, they're keeping that one-year MLF interest rate unchanged at 2.5%, also refraining from that net cash injection as well. We'll see how that all plays out. But yes, largely speaking, that was uh, expected here when it comes to no change to that MLF here. Dollar China, we are seeing some strength, though, slightly after that announcement, 7-20-21. Uh, so reversing some of the initial losses there when it comes to the currency. Uh, this is what the pre-market is set up looking like here today. So, uh, of course, we're still on bull market territory or on bull market watch when it comes to the H shares. We didn't quite get there this week, but we're still watching the tech space very closely as well. Hang Seng, though, pre-market down 1.2 percent. This is Bloomberg. All right, your pre-market is looking a little bit uh, on the gloomy side here today. Take a look at HS Tech. We're down about 2%, but obviously uh, lots of gains are really driven by the tech space here this week. Eight shares also down about 1%. In terms of what we're tracking, of course, is the onshore market seems to be looking a little bit better in terms of prospects, right? We're talking about a five-week winning streak that we are set to hit for Shanghai, and that's the longest streak we've seen since July 2022. What's really driving into this trade? Well, you know, is it the national team? That certainly is one sort of question. If you take a look at how the inflows into ETFs has been recently, we actually have seen a bit of a drop in terms of slowing sort of ETF inflows. There may be signs of the state-led funds stepping back. You have the open coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're counting down to the open of markets here. The pre-market in Hong Kong not looking too good here right now. We're down about 1.2 percent. Obviously, that U.S. PPI report seems to be rolling a little bit of the risk assets uh, this morning, just given what we saw with that 10 basis point move to the upside when it comes to the 10-year yield in the U.S. So stocks a little bit on the back foot here today. We're watching very closely new home prices coming out any second now. Bell. Yeah, and there's also that decision to keep the key rate in China on hold, and that is going to be something really disappointing investors here. When you take a look at it in aggregate as well, draining that net liquidity from the system, this is about drip feed stimulus, and that's what investors really have not been wanting to see here. But you've got the markets that are going to be starting to trade here, Hong Kong, mainland China, in just a few moments here. And as Yvonne said, uh, setting up for a day of weakness. So at the start here, you're just keeping an eye on those bank stocks in particular, uh, not really seeing too much reaction coming so far. But the picture is uh, to the downside for the CSI 300. As I said, they're holding that one-year MLF rate at 2.5%. Uh, it was a decision that was in line with what economists had been expecting, but as well refraining or draining that liquidity from the system there around $13 billion. That's uh, refraining for the first time that we've seen since November 2022. 
as I said, it is that drip feed style that's coming through. Uh, the, the reaction as well, we are just seeing, again, not too much so far in the currency so far, but just a little bit of weakness further. You're just under that 7.2 mark. Uh, let's change on, take a look, broader markets, what we've got in the setup for today, because, yes, as you said, Yvonne, there's also that Wall Street story that's playing into it because we had stocks slipping overnight. Uh, there was that PPI that came out. We also had uh, more data around jobs numbers or the labour market pointing to that resilience there. It does tell us that the Fed really can afford to hold at this point in time. What else is playing into the story today? You've just seen those new home prices again. They're falling for another month, uh, down around 0.4%. So you can see that's really going to be something that plays into the iron ore story today. Uh, if you change on, you can see that Dalian contract there down around six tenths of a percent. But on the Singapore contract, you are heading back down to that $100 a tonne mark. Mining stocks, they're so far pretty mixed in the picture today. But broadly, actually, materials have been has been dragging Asia stocks to the downside. And let's change on, just take a look at how those property names are faring in relation to those home sales prices. And again, uh, you are just seeing some not trading just yet. Vanka one to note as well, given those woes that are continuing to extend. You're seeing them really pulling back from February land sales as well. But uh, Yvonne, perhaps a little bit more context on those numbers. Yeah, you know, you take a look at, I mean, it's a 0.36% drop month on month, right? Um, it's, it's an, I believe it's a ninth straight month where we actually have seen contraction when it comes to new home prices, but that drop is slower than January. But keep in mind, back in January, that drop was negative 0.37%. So we're only talking about a basis point or two in terms of difference here. So it seems like it, it remains the same sort of picture. Used home prices, though, a bit of a steeper drop, 0.62% month on month, but that drop also was slower than the previous month as well. So as you say, you know, China Wonka is the one to watch as the bellwether here right now. Those contracted sales were down, what, more than 50%. Mm. So I don't think it really kind of shows a much change, really, uh, in terms of physical sales in this property market here right now. Let's bring in more on the market action that's going on here in China and bring in our Asia equities reporter, Charlotte Yang. You know, despite this data is bad, MLF unchanged, um, certainly could lead to some disappointment, but I think it was largely expected. You are seeing, broadly speaking, Sentiment is improving in China in some ways. I think broadly speaking, um, definitely, especially if we compare with you know the pessimism in January and also people how like not knowing what to do in February. Right now, we are seeing northbound. It looks like it's heading to the second consecutive inflows, and um, but what we're seeing is actually a pretty big divide between those who are still very cautious, seeing this is just like a technically positioning opportunity given how cheap China is, versus like a small group of investors who are getting more optimistic about you know this new vision that there will be more policies coming out to achieve the ambitious growth target. So I think uh, what remains to be focused is definitely um, where, how, how inflation will do after that, you know, the issues we had. And then with property, that's still the big problem everyone has. You know. Yeah, you, you were tracking some of these southbound flows have been strong. I think it's like 20 straight days where mainland investors have bought in. Northbound also, as you mentioned, is there a need for the national team? to still support this market in a big way or, or is it you know time for them to kind of move in the sidelines a bit yeah, so it's, so there's really uh, this really interesting um, piece of research coming from, uh, from Bloomberg Intelligence because everybody has been wondering, you know, how much has the national team buying, how the speed of them buying. So, um, well, it's, it's it's hard to say how much they bought through the uh, northbound, but for the broader market, we are seeing that the buying is actually being slowing. Um, the, the, uh, they, they've, they've bought 50 billion of dollars over the past f five months, and they've been concentrated in late January and February. You know, when market was at, in this panic selling mode, but right now um, that buying has been slowing uh, since the f last two days. Uh, since the first two days of last week, so um, at the moment it looks like they are standing on the sideline, just monitoring how market will go from here. Okay. What else are you watching out for next week? We got big data dump out of China, the like. What's your team watching closely? Yeah, I think it's the, definitely was you know how retail sales is feeling and also in the industrial prices and um, and whether that uh, and also whether that earnings um, you know bright spots we're seeing with some companies could continue into next week because you know the, actually the, the bulk of the earnings will only come later the last two weeks of this month so it's still worth worth watching. Yeah, and as you say, positive surprises have led to quite rewarding results uh, when it comes to stock reaction as well. Charlotte, thank you, our Asia equities reporter Charlotte Yang there on what's really uh, moving these markets here this morning. We got plenty more. Head. This is Bloomberg.
All right, we're checking Nippon Steel here this morning. Uh, we're just hearing of when it comes to Nippon Steel, this stock, not moving a whole lot, but there were some statements coming through from the company uh, when it guards to talking about their proposed acquisition of U.S. Steel. And they're saying basically right now, determined to see through this transaction, they're progressing with the regulatory review on U.S. Steel, and they will commit an additional $1.4 billion in investment after this deal has been made. Uh, so no layoffs, plant closures until September 2026. It's according to Nippon Steel here this morning, but certainly uh, they continue to defend this deal uh, after we heard from President Joe Biden earlier saying that the company should retain American ownership. So that leads us to more, of course, uh, the geopolitics and what we've been seeing in our big interview of the day. The U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, says channels of communication between the two nations' militaries are starting to open up. Here's more from our exclusive interview. As the ambassador weighs in on U.S. alliances in the Asia Pacific and Beijing's increased military spending. The two presidents, President Biden and President Xi, agreed in San Francisco that we would begin again serious high-level communication between our militaries. This is Has it happened? It's beginning to happen, and it's critical because our two militaries are operating in very close proximity to, to each other in the Spratleys and Paracels right. and the Sinkakus and the Taiwan Strait. And so chairman, our new chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chairman Brown, has had a discussion with his Chinese counterpart, right. and we hope very much that Secretary Austin will be able to talk to his counterpart um, in, the, in the coming weeks or months. And, and then we hope there'll be even conversations at a more uh, tactical level between our militaries. This is common sense because you want to drive down the possibility of any kind of accident or misunderstanding between our air forces or our navies. We do know at the National People's Congress, uh, China increased the military budget by 7.2 percent, the biggest increase in five years. First of all, are you concerned by that, or how should we read that? Well, what we're concerned about is the fact that the PLA is not transparent about how the money is being spent. You know in the issue of China's nuclear weapons uh, buildup, they're not transparent with the rest of the world, uh, and that's a problem. And of course, you know, the United States has been a principal military actor in the Indo-Pacific since the close of the Second World War. What we've been doing, and President Biden has had a lot of success in this, is to build up our alliances with Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, Thailand, right. sure. Australia. We've created AUKUS, and of course we have the Quad with India, all designed to protect the democratic countries of this region and protect international law in places like the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. We're also hearing uh, that the Biden administration wants to and is exerting pressure on allies like the Netherlands, like Japan, like Germany, like South Korea to further the curbs of other products into China. Uh, how does that not expand that pressure and, and actually bifurcate the relationship further? We've been very clear that we uh, adhere to a small yard, high fence scenario, meaning these are targeted actions that, um, that regulates uh, AI investment by American companies in the AI sector here. These are common sense actions by the United States. Any American government would have to take this action given the competition we have underway in the military sphere between the People's Liberation Army and the United States. And I don't think there's an American alive who would say that we should sell advanced technology to the PLA. So the president's acted in the national defense here. And uh, as I said, we're not going to negotiate or compromise on this. And these are the actions that a government has to take to protect in the 21st century. In an age when technology is at the heart of international politics, some of it has to be regulated. That was the U.S. Ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, there with our Chief North Asia Correspondent Stephen Engel in Beijing. Let's bring in Joseph Gregory Mahoney now, a Professor of Politics and International Relations at East China Normal University. Professor, it's really great to have you. Um, I was looking at your take on this, this Burns interview where he, he's saying, look, at least military communication is opening up, but when it comes to curbs on technology and, and high-end manufacturing, those things are still very much in place. What does that tell you about the relationship between U.S. and China now? 
Well, you know, one of the concerns that we have, of course, is that uh, relations, or, or rather communications, were interrupted due to uh, the U.S. Uh, intervening in uh, Taiwan affairs. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, they, they took their own dark track during the Trump administration and then went further off track with Biden. Uh, one of the things that China was concerned about is uh, that the United States was using these high-level military communications in order to um, uh, give it more cover, to push more assets, military assets, into uh, uh, this region. Um, and China was thinking, okay, well, why would we want to talk with you so that we can better coordinate you uh, moving more assets in? Uh, and so, you know, but nevertheless, this is what they did in, in San Francisco. They agreed to this. And then, of course, just in the past couple of weeks, we've seen reports that now the United States has deployed special forces uh, on the front lines in Taiwan. So I think this was always a concern, and it shows, it, it demonstrates the general trend. As for the, the chips uh, restrictions and, and what uh, President Xi calls a technology blockade, that aims to encircle and suppress China. Uh, clearly, this is something the United States is completely committed to, and it will continue to advance. Do you think they'll, they'll commit to a TikTok ban? I mean, how realistic is it, do you think? Well, you know, so it's sort of funny because I saw the, the Burns interview, and one of the things he said is that it's ironic that China would uh, uh, raise this issue when China blocks uh, uh, American companies, when, America, when, when China makes companies like Google and, and uh, uh, other firms uh, illegal in China. In fact, uh, what's ironic is that just before the Super Bowl, uh, the Biden campaign launched its own TikTok account to try to appeal to young American voters, precisely the young people it aims to protect, uh, it, it says, from Chinese influence. Or, or, or spying. At the same time, what we see is that, uh, the, in fact, it's not illegal to use Twitter or X or, or Facebook or any of these products in China. Rather, there is a, a law that says that companies have to abide by Chinese national security laws. Now, some technology firms choose to do that. Apple, for example, locates its servers in China. Uh, Tesla has accommodated the law. Therefore, Ch uh, Tesla does a thriving business here, as does Microsoft. So, you know, it's really not a matter of targeting specific American companies or trying to force them to change or sell their products to uh, non-American uh, uh, um, um, uh, firms. It's really about uh, the U.S. Congress targeting a Chinese firm very specifically, uh, a firm that has been abiding by uh, U.S. laws. So how do you think China is looking at this, this TikTok debate uh, and this bill that's being circled around Congress right now? I'm just wondering, you know, is, is this something that could spark some retaliation from, from Beijing? And in what form do you think? Well, the first problem, of course, is whether or not uh, this ban will actually uh, uh, be put in place. It'll have to pass the Senate and then be signed uh, by the president. It could be challenged in court. And then, then it comes to the question of enforcement. Is, is the United States going to build something like its own uh, great firewall? Is it going to criminalize uh, Americans using TikTok? Uh, what, how do you enforce this uh, sort of ban? And, and it's, it's, again, sort of funny because it's precisely the sort of thing that the United States has said that it doesn't want to do, that it doesn't do, that, uh, that it's now is sort of trying to say, well, we have to emulate China on this point because uh, China is doing the same. In fact, China is doing something different. But nevertheless, it's, it's kind of a, a questionable and dark path. Uh, as to whether or not it will be uh, a ban and what the consequences are, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But certainly, um, China mm -hmm. does operate on the principle of reciprocity. And we could see American firms being targeted uh, specifically. And I think firms like Apple, uh, Tesla, GM, and others are, should be worried at this point. And I guess people are also talking about what this U.S. election will, will mean for, for China, right? If it's going to be Trump 2.0 or another Biden uh, term. I'm just wondering, it seems like both are, are sort of a lose-lose situation for Beijing. Is that the right way to look at it? You know, I think a lot of Americans share that opinion, too, that it's a loose, loose uh, situation for, for America. But nevertheless, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 consensus that seems to be emerging in China is that uh, Trump is a, is, a, is a bigger disruptor and that uh, he will bring uh, more instability faster. But that instability would affect both China and the United States, uh, and therefore um, that would be uh, uh, something to consider. Now, Beijing hates instability, so uh, there's the cost there. But, uh, uh, at the same time, Biden uh, seems to have a more strategic bent. He's much better at building alliances. Um, and so uh, over the long term, uh, Biden is also a, a danger. So uh, it's really a matter of picking your poison. But in the case of China, of course, they don't get to pick. That's up to the American citizens. Um, you, you mentioned if it's Trump 2.0 that there is you know, a sense that he might resist his impulses 
that he's foreshadowed, right? Tariffs and an increase of, of that. We saw that with the TikTok ban and, and he's kind of backing out from his decision or from his sort of what he started was this ban uh, went back in 2020. So is there something that people are kind of underestimating uh, with Trump 2.0? Well, you know, again, it's sort of difficult uh, because we, we see a lot of comments from Trump uh, and that are not simply directed at China, but also uh, other countries. For example, uh, what he said about Iran, where uh, he would uh, potentially uh, advance more assassinations, uh, more sanctions, uh, maybe even direct attacks. Um, this sort of uh, gives us some clues into what his uh, broader foreign policy might be. Um, and I think certainly mm -hmm. uh, there have been some questions about how he might treat China. Uh, significantly increasing tariffs or not, uh, uh, refusing to defend Taiwan if attacked or not. Um, so, you know, these are these are things that uh, are, are in and themselves are already creating instability because people don't know what to expect going forward if Trump is reelected. I was going to ask you about, you know, what you initially said about um, the military sort of actions that we're seeing, particularly when it comes to South China Sea recently, uh, and the clashes that we've seen with the Philippines, for example. And it seems like the strategy from, from the Philippines now is more of, of sort of like a, you know, publishing outright what goes on. Is that strategy the right approach? And does it work in terms of reining in China when it comes to, you know, them asserting these historical claims on the South China Sea? Well, I think what we've seen with the new uh, presidential administration in Philippines is the Philippines tilting more in the direction of the United States. We've seen uh, the expanded uh, presence of U.S. forces on uh, Philippine military bases. Um, so it seems that the Philippines has made a, a choice and has chose a side at this point, although, of course, it still has substantial economic relations uh, with China. Uh, I think the, you know, the bigger question is why is China asserting itself in the South China Sea? And this is because, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Burns said in his interview, the U.S. has been operating here since the end of World War II uh, quite extensively, and the South China Sea has long been the soft underbelly of Chinese national security. And we know from some reports that there's quite a bit going on underneath the water. For example, American submarines running into sea mounts and all sorts of other things that have directly threatened Chinese security. So I don't think China is asserting itself in the South China Sea in order to challenge Philippines' sovereignty, but rather to protect itself. And uh, the Philippines are simply a casualty of this. Unfortunately, the Philippines are following the U.S. down this path, and it will continue to uh, be a flashpoint. Joseph, great to have you. Joseph Gregory Mahoney there, professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University. Some other geopolitical stories that we're following for you today. The leader of Yemen's Houthi rebels says that the group will expand their anti-ship attacks to Israel-linked ships in the Indian Ocean. He says the Houthis carried out three attacks in the Indian Ocean this week and won't stop until the war in Gaza ends. A shipbroker said this week that sea traffic using the Cape of Good Hope route is up 85% since December due to Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. The Biden administration has sanctioned two Israeli settlements in the West Bank and called on Israel to do more to end violence against Palestinians there. It's the second time since February the administration has imposed sanctions on Israeli settlers. Separately, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has broken with official policy in calling for Israel to hold new elections. India's elections watchdog says Prime Minister Modi's BJP received nearly half of political donations made through electoral bonds over the past five years. The BJP took in more than $730 million worth, compared with about $170 million for the main opposition Congress party. The government introduced the bonds in 2018, but last month the Supreme Court struck them down as arbitrary and unconstitutional. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, just want to recap what we just saw in the last few minutes or so, that one-year MLF unchanged at 2.5%, but also withdrawing that net injection, so a net drain of $94 billion, which is what we haven't seen for some time here. So it was a hold, plus they're not injecting cash into the system. What does that tell you about monetary policy moving forward? New home prices as well as used home prices still saw a net contraction there, but the drop was slower than what we saw in the previous month there, so maybe... But still, we're still talking about, I think, six or eight, nine months, I should say, of contraction when it comes to new home prices. Uh, also, that fix, a much stronger one here today. We're talking about more than 1,000 pips stronger than what estimates were 
this morning. Pre-market, actually pre-market, Hong Kong market is doing this right now. We're seeing 1% losses for Hang Seng as well as MSCI China. Uh, CSI 300, we're seeing marginal losses, though. It looks like we're still on track for a fifth week of gains for Shanghai stocks. And certainly we've been talking about, you know, can these sort of foreign inflows back into this market offset the national team sort of inflows into ETFs, which have been waning of late here as well. HS Tech, though, that's what we're seeing most of the downside here today. We're talking about uh, copper prices. Iron ore continues that decline. Of course, we're, we're watching those Singapore futures and whether we're actually getting closer to 100 or 110 these days. Shanghai crude, though, is seeing a bit of a pop here this morning. And CGB is not doing a whole lot. We're down one basis points for your 30-year yield. So it seems like the risk is tilted more towards bonds here today over equities. Hanhai, though, this is the outperformer uh, in Taiwan that we're watching very, very closely on the back of those earnings. So, yes, they did talk about the weakness when it comes to iPhone sales and the like, but AI certainly did drive uh, most of those results and really helped in terms of being a buffer uh, when it comes to, of course, those smartphone sales. So certainly, Han Hai is one of the key performers here uh, in the Asia Pacific. You take a look at how HS Tech is looking here right now, mostly lower here right now with Ping On Health as King D International, the only exception there. We've got our exclusive interview with Suntory CEO coming up as well as we count down to those Rengo wage talks. Welcome back to the China Show, the second hour, and here's a pulse check of what the CSI 300 is doing just a half hour into the session here. Seeing some downside, Hong Kong is feeling a little bit more in terms of that hit from the rising yields that we saw across treasuries and here in the region. Bell has an update for us. Hey, Bell. It's all about those moves that we're seeing in, in the bond space in particular because we had Treasury yields, for instance, tracking high overnight, that 10-year hitting around that 4.3% mark. And today in the session as well, are you seeing that rise coming through? So we had U.S. inflation data, PPI numbers coming out. We also had more signals of strength in the labor market. And so that just tells you the Fed's got time here going in its favor, and it can actually afford to wait to cut rates. And so that's leading to those moves. You see dollar strength off the back, currency weakness coming through. You've got the Korean and one leading the drop there you can see down eight tenths of percent close currency of course uh, so it does really tend to have those more outsized reactions so far in the asian session what else we're tracking is that broad weakness we're seeing in equities across the picture today. And there's a couple of key different themes that are playing into that. But I want to get into the China story a bit more detail. Let's change on and take a look at how we're trading so far, 30 minutes into the session. And you do have that, I'm going to say disappointment. It's a sense of, of disappointment. Traders always want to see more when it comes to Chinese stimulus. And we just had uh, the PBOC holding that key rate steady at 2.5%. Yes, it was a decision that was expected by, by most in our survey, but still uh, it's that drip feed approach that we're seeing to stimulus. Again, that cash drain coming away from the banking system, so trying to control liquidity as well. So you do see, again, as I said, weakness in Chinese equities. The Chinese yuan holding fairly steady at this point in time, but concerns as well are building or continuing around the health of China's economy, very much re reflected in what we see in iron ore prices. You've got the contract in Singapore slipping back down to that $100 mark. Iron ore as well under pressure on the Dalian contract. But let's change on. Again, that story of the materials complex is really feeding into the dynamics that we're seeing so far in the Asian trading session. Taking a look at the IMAP function for the broader benchmark here, materials standing out the clear laggard so far in the session. What is moving to the upside, a little bit of positivity coming through, and we can end on that note. Uh, energy very much in focus because we had the IEA overnight, if you just change on now, uh, flipping its forecast into deficit. It was earlier seeing a surplus through the course of this year. So there are those things about that shorter term uh, question of, of oil supplies looking constrained. You're seeing WTI pushing above that key psychological $80 a barrel level. And again, those energy supplies moving to the upside. Of course, Yvonne, it's always that question. How long do you see that in place? When do those concerns around China's demand really start to take uh, that more center seat again? Yeah. I mean, you look at iron ore and what's been doing, right? We're, we're seeing one of the worst weeks in, in some time here when it comes to iron ore, metal prices as well. Uh, Bell, thank you for that update here. We'll have probably more coming up with Bell. On uh, what's really driving the price action here this morning, let's bring in our Bloomberg MY strategist, Mary Nicola, now joining us out of Singapore. Mary, um, we'll start on China. I mean, it seems like this was a disappointment, the fact that there was no cut to this MLF. They're draining cash also out of the system in some ways. Is that how you read it? 
Yeah, there is a huge aspect in the fact that, you know, uh, equity markets won't be happy with this and the fact that any opportunity that you get to ease, they're not taking that chance. And if you look at some of the data, the data is still coming out weak. So there's no fundamental support that drives equities higher. So what you really need is more support from the government. And obviously, we're not seeing that when the MLF um, rate stays steady. And of course, some of the data comes in a lot weaker um, and just just says the same narrative uh, about China being on very shaky grounds. And, and you know, it, it brings us to the discussion of the Fed as well, right? And and you know, PPI prices that seem to be leading to this sell-off that we're seeing across Treasuries once again. Perhaps that's why we're seeing this the Asia Pacific region really uh, react quite negatively to that. Um, it, it brings us to our question of the day. You know, if we actually see any change in the dots next week from the Fed from three to two, what would that mean for markets? Yeah, it, it means more dollar strength, in fact. So if we're going to start seeing another repricing, we've already had a sharp repricing from, you know, seven cuts um, by the market. Now we're about three, so pretty much in line with the Fed. But then, of course, you get down to two, that puts up. Uh, puts up another um, a little oomph for the dollar as well. But then at the same time, you have to keep in mind how Powell is going to pitch this. So if let's say we move the dot pots from three to two, how does Powell accompany the statement? If he accompanies it with more easing, then the impact on the dollar will likely be limited. However, if he says highlights concerns about inflation, that'll be read as a little a lot more hawkish. Yeah, I mean, there's so much going on next week, Mary, whether it's the BOJ, it's the Fed. You know, we, we were asking our viewers what, what, what matters more. Uh, which, which central bank is going to matter more next week, you think? Yeah, it's interesting because there's 13 central bank meetings next week, but only two really matter. <laughs> so it's the BOJ and the Fed, at least for markets, right? So if we look at how the BOJ is going to react, does it actually e exit negative interest rate policy? Does it um, get rid of YCC as well? So that really will depend on what we get from the Ringo uh, wage negotiations. That could be the key tipping point that brings the BOJ over the line and, and do, uh, to do something on the Tuesday. But then in the broader context, then you also have the Fed and the Fed sh potentially shifting uh, to the, its dot plots from three to two, obviously creating a lot of angst in the markets. However we position it, it's just going to create more volatility, more angst. But in the meantime, the dollar is likely to remain supported, especially if we see that, that continued anxiety over where the Fed could be headed. And the yen is in the middle of that, right, as you say. Are we seeing a yen that could be, you know, closer to 150 now, which is where we are in some ways, or are we talking about 140 levels? Where, where are we likely to hit first? The. I think for the end, it's a lot shakier grounds where you would probably have more upside potential. A dollar yen will have more upside potential, so you could hit probably 150, especially of all the concerns about the dollar coming through. And then if the if they actually follow through, you will get a jolt for the end. So you could see some sort of exuberance that they're finally exiting policy. But we've got to remember that for the for the BOJ, they're actually just normalizing policy. They're not going to start a hiking cycle. If you look at forecasts for the for the BOJ policy rate, it's just that going to move to 0.1. And where is every other global central bank? They're in a much different state. So if you look at, is there really an alternative for a funding currency other than the yen? Not really right now. So that will keep the pressure on the yen. But the initial exuberance from the BOJ finally exiting policy could bring dollar yen to, let's say, 145. But... Anything, lo mm. anything lower is going to be a, a lot more dependent on the Fed. Mary, great stuff. Mary Nicola there, our MLI strategist joining us out of Singapore. Still ahead, we're going to stick up to Japan and hear how Japan businesses are preparing for the eventual end to negative interest rates. And of course, what's going to happen with those Rengo talks, right? The, this expectation is maybe for 5% or higher in terms of wage growth. Is that enough to pivot? For the BOJ, our exclusive interview with Centauri's president and CEO, Takeshi Niyonami, is next. This is Bloomberg.
right, one of our top stories here this morning, Japan's largest umbrella group for labor unions, Rango, is due to announce the initial results of spring wage negotiations later on today. And this is going to be key, right? Is it the last puzzle for the Bank of Japan to decide on whether to exit negative rates as soon as next week? Let's get the corporate angle now and bring in Takeshi Ninami, president and CEO at Suntory Holdings. He also chairs the business lobby group, the Japan Association of Corporate Executives. He's joined by our Tech Asia executive editor Peter Elstrom in our Tokyo studios. Peter, take it away. Hi, as you mentioned, we are here today with Tak Ninami. Thank you so much for joining us today, the CEO of Suntory Holdings. Your company is one of the most prominent in Japan, and it gives you uh, access to see how the Japan economy is doing, how Japan consumers are doing. As we head into this next week, where the BOJ is going to have to contemplate whether to exit negative rates, what's your view on the state of the Japan economy and how consumers are doing at this point? At this moment, the consumers are not confident yet, and they are so worried about the future. The one thing is uh, uh, whether the, uh, our social security is uh, sustainable or not, mm -hmm. and their wage will increase uh, sustainably. So the key factor is uh, how we can extend the current uh, momentum of uh, uh, wage increases, maybe next year and uh, onward. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be happening because the key factor is uh, huge labor shortage. Mm -hmm. So big corporations started to, uh, to recruit and retain uh, good talent. In doing so, we need to raise you know, wages. Mm -hmm. So next year, that will happen too. So I'm so much confident that the consumers will be back mm -hmm. to, to buy things, but not the luxuries. Mm -hmm. You've been quite outspoken about the importance of raising wages in Japan, where wages have not been going up that much recently. I think at Suntory in particular, you've raised wages about 7%. Uh, we're going to get these numbers for Japan later on today. Why is that so important to how the economy works from here on forward? I think uh, um, consumers should be more confident that uh, wages will be increasing furthermore. And uh, we want to be the uh, spearhead because we are the uh, biggest uh, um, food uh, uh, industry player. And uh, we should lead it to change the momentum. And uh, we are getting out of the deflation for 30 years, right? And toward the inflation. That should be moderate. So people don't know yet. And there is still inertia. Mm -hmm. Of course, investor. You mentioned that consumers are not so confident. Investors are very confident. They've driven stocks to all-time highs, as we've seen here. But you make the point that that puts some pressure on corporations here. Can you explain what you mean by that? Usually, high stock prices tend to be kind of a good sign for companies. Well, there is a disconnect between the, the real economy and uh, the stock market. But we have to feel the, the disconnect. And how to feel is, you say, to raise the returns uh, against the uh, equity and the invested cash. But uh, we need uh, the uh, huge passion from uh, workers because uh, we need more talented people and we need to retrain them. So which means uh, uh, to, 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 to um, keep the uh, current momentum toward the, uh, the future, definitely uh, we have to keep raising the wages and uh, make people feel Wow, we can consume, and uh, that momentum is needed. So the key thing is definitely we have to finish the uh, deflationary spiral, mm -hmm. spiral, and uh, now. Okay, thank you. Vaughn has a question. For Takeshi. You. Yeah, Takeshi, sounds great to talk to you again. Uh, it's interesting because you know, you, you're the chairperson of uh, the, this association of corporate executives. Yes, it's interesting that Centauri is leading the way in terms of these wage increases. Are we seeing that across the board with the corporate execs that you talk to, especially when it comes to some of these smaller firms? Well, yes, smaller firms, whether they are making money or not, they need to raise wages. So that's a huge change from the before. The reason is they need people. And uh, the current uh, momentum is pushing people to, to change jobs, in especially SMEs. So to retain good people, they have to definitely raise wages. Otherwise, they can't uh, keep people. And uh, there are many cases nowadays we see the bankruptcies of SMEs because of a shortage of labor. That is a phenomenon. Yeah, and, and Takeshi-san, you, 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 of course, you talked about waging, raising wages by 7% uh, for Suntory.
Does that mean what could follow is, is some of you know, price increases in your products? Because I think you, know, you, you raised whiskey prices early last year. Are we seeing the strong enough wage growth to suggest that maybe product prices can also be seeing some price hikes? Well, that's a good question. I'm not 100% confident, but uh, before summer, I think we have a huge opportunity to be able to raise prices. But after summer, um, we don't know about that because uh, how we can keep the uh, you know, current uh, above 3% uh, inflation, that is uh, sustainable or not. And uh, that's the sharing concept be between us, business, and uh, BOJ. So we have to keep raising wages uh, for the next years to come. So that's another issue we have to discuss and how. So that means we have to keep investing, such as AI, digital, healthcare. Um, private sector needs to invest more to create uh, uh, more demands to people, though we need more people. But that means huge demand to people means keep raising um, uh, uh, wages. So more investment is needed, but there is a huge opportunity for Japanese corporates to keep investing to Japan nowadays. Question for you, as Japan makes these investments in the economy, one of the key uh, areas has been the semiconductor sector. We've seen big investments in Kumamoto in particular and Hokkaido now too. That's put a lot of pressure on real estate development in particular. It's hard to get workers for those areas. Is that sustainable and will that lead to future growth? And which other areas are going to be key for economic growth? Well, how we can uh, fill the gap of the labor shortage, three options. One is extending the working age from, uh, uh, from 64 to uh, 74 or 5. Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, you know, underway. And a lot of people work uh, even after the 65. That's a huge, huge potential for us to bring more laborers to women. I think uh, we can have more opportunity for, for women to work furthermore. Third, people from abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have to say it's, it's been a taboo, but we have to you know, get rid of this taboo so that we can bring more people from abroad. Mm -hmm. And in case of the chips, we definitely need uh, high skilled laborers and uh, three, four more projects are waiting for chip factories in Japan. And Japan is best fitted for making chips because of clean water. Mm -hmm. And the second issue we have to resolve is uh, energy. So some more uh, nuclear reactors are going to be resumed and more energy is needed. But the uh, chip work, I mean, uh, factories in Kumamoto and uh, Hokkaido will be booming to attract more people from abroad too. Mm -hmm. You mentioned immigration has been sort of taboo in Japan policy in the past. There are some programs at this point to at least make incremental changes, but what advice would you have for how to change those policy issues to help businesses like Suntory and beyond Suntory? Well, used to use the uh, uh, laborers from uh, abroad as a cheap labor, but we have to bring them to, to treat them as the other Japanese people, to be honest. So that means we have to create the uh, new um, community rules to accept the people from abroad, and which means immigration should be discussed positively. And my uh, uh, association of the business community, community will discuss further, and uh, perhaps we will propose to the uh, government. Okay, some changes. Okay. And you've talked a bit about the weak yen. Over the past few years, we've seen the, the yen weaken a fair, fairly substantial amount. What's your view now on the yen and where it is and how businesses navigate through this changing currency environment? Okay. First and foremost, uh, to what extent uh, will Bank of Japan ease the monetary policy? I don't think they'll, they want to ease the policy, the monetary policy, and unleashed. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, they will uh, change the, the, the from a negative to positive, but uh, slightly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean uh, they want to unleashed. I mean, they get the, the monetary policy unleashed. Mm -hmm. So, which means, which means, the uh, still Bank of Japan will keep the uh, uh, easing policy of monetary monetary policy, mm -hmm. and and that means the uh, I mean we can won't be changed. But key factor is the Fed. Mm -hmm. The Fed will 
uh, lower the interest rates three times, four times, to what extent? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure the uh, current level will be uh, uh, not uh, sustained. Perhaps the uh, 140 or 135, so 150 is the uh, cheapest, but the uh, weakest. So, but the trajectory is not uh, so much volatile mm -hmm. in terms of the value of yen. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, that's needed for business, because the volatility is the major risk for us. So. Mm -hmm. Let's say 135 around and the 40. But down from here. Right, that's right. That's right. You, you make the point. Depen the dep depends on Fed as well, okay. not you, the Bank of Japan. You make the point that the priority is the economy and the health of the economy going forward, not exactly where the currency is. And the Bank of Japan won't make these decisions in a vacuum. They have to be aware of what the Fed is doing. So the Bank of Japan can revert, can move out of negative rate territory, but partly how far they can move will depend on what happens in the Fed and other central banks. Is that? Is yeah, that your point right. of view? Okay, let's take a look at the long term. YCC already dismantled. Mm -hmm. It's about the one percent means it's now standing around the zero point seven mm -hmm. or six. Mm -hmm. So the, up to the market already. So, mm -hmm. so oh, I mean now the, already the messages were given to the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 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 I, mean I think uh, uh, the, the current market uh, 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 money market is based on the uh, messages given by the uh, Bank of Japan, which is not uh, unleashed but to some extent, mm -hmm. and the negative rate will be dismantled and waiting for feds and uh, perhaps, perhaps. Okay. I want to ask you one last question. Um, one of the biggest deals now that we are talking about in cross-border deals is Nippon Steel's attempt to buy U.S. steel. It's become quite controversial. Suntory has done one of the biggest U.S. Japan Japan U.S. deals so far. You bought Jim Beam a few years ago. What's your advice about how to navigate something like this? And this is a fourteen billion dollar deal that has national security implications. What, what would be your suggestions about how to navigate something like this, given the political tensions around the deal? Well, this is a tough time for the cross border deal between any country, the United States, at the election year. So. And the labor union is different than the, the here. So how to collaborate with the labor unions is such a huge challenge. But definitely the key uh, stakeholder is definitely labor union. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending this time in the studio with us, our new studio. And we will give it back to Yvonne. Thank, thank you, you, you very much. much. Thank you. All right, Peter, you're a pro. Please come back and do more of this. Akeshi Ninami, their president and CEO at Suntory Holdings and chairperson of the Japan Association of Corporate Executives. Thank you so much for joining us there. Wide-ranging interview there. Taylor, when it comes to the yen, of course, we're still talking about those Rango talks that could be happening. 4.15 Tokyo time. So we're getting the official numbers there, how these results came through. 148.56, a little bit of weakness on your Japanese yen and weakness across equities uh, across the region as well with the Hang Seng leading things lower down one6 Six percent. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, a bit of a pullback when it comes to some of these chip stocks here this morning. Uh, we're watching Wuxi, though, those assets very closely here. So the journal is reporting that apparently uh, they did actually leave voluntarily a U.S. lobbying meeting as well. So you're seeing Wuxi assets on the back foot here today. We're down some 7%. Uh, Morgan Stanley coming out with a pretty interesting note here talking about, you know, they're expecting in event key med to recover uh, amidst, of course, all these geopolitical tensions that have been really riling the biotech space uh, in China. So those two are on the up. In terms of what we're seeing in chip stocks and the like, we're tracking the Samsung scoop that we had about them uh, poised to win over $6 billion uh, when it comes to uh, expanded U.S. investment. So beyond just that project that they currently have announced uh, in Texas. But uh, we're still seeing when it comes to some of these chip stocks today, a bit of a pullback of more than 1% for Samsung, TSMC, and Aventus in Japan. Hanhai, though, is doing its own thing. AI hardware sales is what's really boosting the, the earnings there. So the stock up some 8%. And we're watching oil as well, and, and metals in particular, right? Whether it's copper, whether it's iron ore. Oil, though, has been holding that four-month gain, as Bell's mentioning. We did that, see that break out above 80 bucks for WTI. That certainly is lifting all these energy plays here this morning. Brent's hovering around the 85 level, but you do see the likes of Impex up some 5%. This is Bloomberg.
11.29 a.m. in Tokyo. Yeah, we're talking just about, what, five hours' time? We might hear a little bit more about how those Rengo talks played out here and whether it's enough. Is it enough wage gains to really suggest that BOJ could move next week? You're hearing more reports saying they could exit on negative rates uh, as soon as March. So certainly that is continuing to lead to a lot of volatility when it comes to dollar yen. We're still on the weaker side here today. We're back to around 148 levels uh, for the yen. Uh, but we're seeing a bit of a bifurcation when it comes to Nikkei 225 and topics here with Nikkei is down. Topics slightly, though, is higher. And yields are picking up when it comes to that 10-year JGB. We're at up two basis points right now. Uh, and so certainly that's one key thing. We're watching very closely what else goes on next week with the Fed, BOJ, as well as a, a dozen or so central bank meetings next week as well, plus a data dump out of China. So it's going to be pretty busy. Let's focus more on the geopolitics now. The top U.S. diplomat to China says every country has a right to defend its national security. Washington has been working to tighten restrictions on China's access to advanced chip-making technology. And the ambassador, Nicholas Burns, spoke exclusively with our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Every country has a duty and responsibility to protect its national security. And what the president has done over the last year and a half is to make it impossible uh, for sensitive American technology, advanced semiconductors for AI purposes to be sold to China because we know it will happen. We know that the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, will take advantage of that technology to strengthen itself at the expense of the American military. We're not going to do that. We're not going to compromise on national security. And we're not going to negotiate. And you can bet that the, that the government here in Beijing is taking similar measures. They have not allowed, for most of the last 20 years, the export of core, sensitive national security applied Chinese technology to the United States. And so, you know, every, every government, and certainly our government, has a right to take these decisive steps, and that's what we're doing. We've heard the terminology that essentially these are high walls but small garden as far as the number of products that are on the export curb list. Uh, but again, this seems to be widening. If these are the industries of the future, it potentially it's going to widen and broaden. We're also hearing uh, that the Biden administration wants to and is exerting pressure on allies like the Netherlands, like Japan, like Germany like South Korea, to further the curbs of other products into China. Uh, how does that not expand that pressure and, and actually bifurcate the relationship further? We've been very clear that we uh, adhere to a small yard, high fence scenario, meaning these are targeted actions that um, that regulates uh, AI investment by American companies in the AI sector here. These are common sense actions by the United States any American government would have to take this action given the competition we have underway in the military sphere between the People's Liberation Army and the United States. And I don't think there's an American alive who would say that we should sell advanced technology to the PLA. So the president's acted in the national defense here. And uh, as I said, we're not going to negotiate or compromise on this. And these are the actions that a government has to take to protect in the 21st century. In an age when technology is at the heart of international politics, some of it has to be regulated. How much of a national security threat is TikTok? Well, you know, I think, you know, the, the White House has spoken to this. The president has spoken to it. And I think Jake Sullivan asked the right questions when he spoke to it uh, this week at the White House. He said, do we want an American company or a Chinese company uh, to own this, this very important uh, technology, TikTok? Do we want an American company to have access to the data of millions of Americans or a Chinese company? But where do and you the draw the line? And the, and the answers to both questions are obvious when it comes to TikTok. But where do you draw the line? Because it could extend to EVs, it could extend to any other potential app that would come into the U.S. market. We've heard a number of complaints from the government here in Beijing this week about uh, the American debate on TikTok. I find it supremely ironic because government officials here are using the X platform to criticize the United States. They don't give their own citizens the right to use X, to use Instagram, to use Facebook, to have access to Google. And so uh, it is ironic indeed that the government here is complaining about a process when they shut down access for 1.4 billion Chinese to all these uh, platforms.
I can tell you that over the last several years, we have kept to a narrow, a narrow band, restricting a narrow band of technologies that are at the heart of our national security, that are critical to the national security. And we believe that what we call de-risking is a sensible, in fact, it's a, it's a necessary policy of the United States. One of the lessons of the pandemic is that we have to uh, alter our supply chain on certain critical materials and critical minerals so that we control them back home or they're close to home. We don't want to be overly dependent on China yeah. for technologies that we must have to defend our borders and defend our country. How worried or concerned should the United States be about what we heard again and again and again in the National People's Congress, and that is the unleashing of new productive forces? Obviously, they need to do that to build out their own AI capabilities, their own advanced chips, uh, and they're going to throw a lot of money, state-backed money, to this. How much of a concern will that ultimately be? No, I think there's a growing concern around the world that if part of what the government here tries to do to deal with its own internal economic problems is to ramp up manufacturing and export that excess production at artificially low prices or dumping uh, to the rest of the world, whether it's Europe on EVs, whether it's the United States, whether it's Japan and South Korea, that's going to roil and disturb and complicate global trade. And uh, we have been very clear about this. I gave a speech uh, just uh, ten, two weeks ago uh, warning about the problems of excess capacity. Our Treasury Department has warned the same, about the same problem. You get out and about. How bad is the Chinese economy from your perspective? Well, I think it's clear that, um, you know, if you look at the um, official reports of the government and you look at the, uh, some of the uh, projections for economic performance over the next couple of years, most economists would say that the economy here will slow down at some point, that the era, a four-decade era of yeah. high single-digit growth is over. There are a number of structural problems they've got to um, deal with. These aren't for the United States to decide, they're for the government of China to decide, but that was obviously the key issue at the s double session of the parliament, the Liang way that uh, that took place here in Beijing over yeah. the last two weeks. Yeah, I was definitely there. I also talked to a lot of businesses, and we all know about the FDI numbers, foreign direct investment, uh, down to the lowest gain since 1993. There is hesitation, yeah. not only because of the economy is weak, but also because of the myriad of different national security and the opacity of such policy, especially coming out of the National People's Congress, we didn't get a lot of clarity on policy. We do know, and you were in that uh, 60 Minutes interview where you did talk about U.S. companies such as Bain and Company, Mints, and others who have seen raids and they've seen uh, arrests of U.S. citizens. Can you, can you elaborate on the threat and the pall that has been cast over the investment community and doing business, Americans doing business in China at this time? I think this is a question central to the U.S.-China relationship for the next year and, and the year beyond. Uh, we have a $575 billion two-way trade relationship. China's the third largest trade partner of the United States. There are thousands of American companies doing business here. Here's the problem. They're hearing conflicting signals. Some senior Chinese government officials say private sector investment is welcome in China, your investment will be protected. But then these companies are also hearing a different message, whether it's the raids against American companies of last March and April, whether it is the opacity of the um, counter-espionage law, where espionage is defined in such a general way that normal activities in any other country of the world, the collection of data, could be construed as espionage. And so we see American firms backing away, or at least being very cautious about investing a lot of money here, because they're not sure where the lines are. And I think the voices that they're hearing from the government here in China about national security, they're the strongest and loudest voices right now. Is it more than just the due diligence companies, the consultancies that have been raided, other industries also in jeopardy? I think so. I mean, I, th I think it does go beyond uh, those firms that were raided uh, a year ago. It, it gets to the fact that um, a lot of companies don't know what the direction of the economy is here and where policy guidelines and parameters will be. And so they're not quite sure if they make a major investment uh, whether that's going to be a rational decision. So a lot of people are sitting on their money. M very few companies are leaving this market. It's such a big market, an important market. But a lot of companies have plan Bs as well. But revenue is down for companies like Apple. But there are two sides to that one. Also Tesla. We've heard that government agencies have been instructed to not 
potentially buy Apple iPhones or even here Tesla's. in China. Here in China, yeah. right? So that also casts a pall too on the, uh, you know, the appetite to invest. In particular, two large bellwethers like Tesla and Apple. You know, we've been very consistent uh, in our government in saying we do not want to see a decoupling of these two economies. We're the two, the U.S. and China, the two largest economies in the world. We're critical for each other's success yeah. given the trade relationship. We're fundamental to the health of the global economy. So we've been very consistent in saying that's not what we're after, but we are de-risking. Uh, we are shutting down advanced technology uh, transfers, sales to China because for national security reasons. How many Americans are potentially detained right now or being charged with anti espionage charges? It's a problem. We have uh, a number of Americans who are what we call uh, wrongfully detained. We don't think, believe they should be incarcerated. We think they should be um, freed. I've visited a number of these people in prison. There's another category of people who are subject to what is called here exit bans. Their passports are taken away or they try to leave the country and they can't leave. We fundamentally object to that. U.S. Ambassador to China Nicholas Burns there speaking in Beijing with her chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And really, I want to bring in Robert Lee from Liberty Intelligence, just out with a report that really talks a little bit more about the chips and self-sufficiency uh, remaining China's primary strategic objective here as the U.S. moves to, to tighten containment measures. And we're certainly hearing that from this Burns interview, Robert. What are those challenges in, in achieving that self-sufficiency in China, just in the face of tightening restrictions on chips as well as sanctions? Yeah, maybe just before I answer that question and listening to the ambassador's um, interview, it mm -hmm. just reminds me again how closely intertwined yeah. the tech sector of the U.S. is with China and vice versa. They're both interdependent on each other to a very large degree. Um, and there are conflicting objectives there. There are obviously the concerns on both sides on national security um, and also economic rivalry, you know, uh, with the US and its allies trying to restrict China's access to advanced semiconductor process technology. But, you know, from a Chinese perspective, China is dependent on advanced process technology that largely comes from either the US, Japan or Europe. Um, they're also dependent or have been historically on advanced chips um, which go into everything from high-end smartphones, telecoms equipment, you name it. So that's the dependency of China. But equally, as the ambassador mentioned, China's a massive market of 1.4 billion consumers. Um, it's a huge market for American tech companies, you know, making up a substantial proportion of revenue for the likes of Apple, Qualcomm, Microsoft, you name it. So it's a very fine balancing act, isn't it? With what the ambassador said, you know, based on national security uh, concerns, obviously they want to restrict China's access to advanced chip making technology. Yeah. But at the same time, the risk is, I think, that the US potentially could do itself damage in the long run given the high reliance on U.S. technology companies uh, on this huge internal market within China. Yeah. So I think over the next few years, that's a, an interesting thing to watch and see how that plays out. And um, for Beijing, I mean, it seems like they're just, you know, throwing money at the, at the issue, right? Is that the right way to do so? I mean, can yeah. they still achieve that self-sufficiency then? So I, I think within semiconductors, China is actually building its share within what's referred to as more mature technologies. So these are chips that go into everyday applications from air conditioners to vacuum cleaners to, you know, automotive electronics. At the moment, there's no restrictions on that area. It is a theoretical risk in the long run, but... Um, Business as usual on that front. The issue is um, the, the restrictions are impacting China's ability to either import advanced chips, again going into high-end smartphones, AI servers, etc. And the restrictions are also impacting China's ability to uh, import the production equipment from the likes of ASML that they could use to fabricate their own chips. And these advanced chips, again, are central to so many applications out there. So whilst the likes of Baidu and Tencent have said, as an example, they have, they've been stockpiling ahead of the restrictions, they're okay for the next year or so, you know, what happens after that? Because fabricating advanced semiconductors at the leading edge, at the atomic scale, is really, really, really hard to do. You know, it's taken TSMC and ASML decades, mm. and there is a, uh, you know, uh, the related supply chain companies, there, there are not just hundreds, there are thousands of them. For example, companies like Carl Zeiss, 
who, you know, a German optics maker who's he's got a hundred year history basically you know they've perfected the optics that go into some of these equipments over many many decades and close to a century yeah. it's very hard for China to sort of replicate and build their own internal technology so it's very hard to put a timeline on it is it going to take them years is it going to take them decades it's somewhere between the two yeah. and it's going to cost a lot of money so as I think you mentioned I think their only option is to continue ramping up the R&D and continue to throw money at the problem Robert, thank you. Great stuff, Robert Lee there. Make sure to check out his report. B.I. Go is where you check out all that research as well from Bloomberg Intelligence. Your HS Tech movers are doing this year right now. We are seeing a bit of a pullback when it comes to some of the tech plays, of course, as we did enter that bull market this week, but mostly all in the red, with exception of just ping on health care here. But what's really driving that lag and that drag, I should say, is Billy Billy, some of the EV plays like Neo, Kwai Show, Hire, Smart Tech, uh, Smart Home and the like, and Meituan here this morning. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, CATL is the next one to report its results this Friday. The world's largest EV battery maker may see a jump in full-year earnings, signaling that it's weathering through the fierce competition in China and a drop in raw material prices. For more, let's bring in Danny Lee, our Asia Transport reporter. What are you expecting out of these results? We're expecting to see robust set of results, and CATL has already given guidance that it looks to see earnings grow despite all the competition. And what we have seen in the back end of last year was them being able to consolidate their market share once more, strengthen their share in China, and importantly, doing so abroad. And being abroad is also very important because where you have this huge price war going on in China, extending from automakers down through the supply chain. And CATO is able to control its pricing and have better pricing uh, abroad with all the foreign automakers. So this is a good hedge for them. I mean, how much of an edge do they have overseas when it comes to their sales there? They are now, at least as of January, uh, the top selling battery maker uh, outside of China. So when you can dominate home and abroad, uh, this is a very good thing for them. And you know, with their market share being around 25% uh, ex-China or thereabouts, it's a really strong position to be in. And when you know, look at their customer base, someone like Tesla, yeah. uh, Mercedes, BMW, a huge range of customers, they are able to uh, better hold on to that pricing, which uh, would otherwise be under pressure. We've seen that in earnings, the fact that earnings overall uh, on, the, on the net income side look to be a beat. Um, so we'll be looking closely after market for what exactly happens, but it's a good set of numbers that looks like to come down the line. Yeah, it's interesting too with latest with those analysts um, from UBS that slashing the price targets of Tesla, uh, just given the fact that there is this weakness uh, in China as well. Danny Lee, thank you with a preview of what to expect out of CATL a little, little bit later on as well. Coming up, we're going to look at what's trending online in your China brief, including why beverage giant Nongfu Spring has found itself under fire from some netizens out there. we got the full story coming up next. All right, here's your China Brief here this morning. A look at some of the stories making headlines in the papers and online. The Shanghai Securities Journal reports that some Chinese high-frequency data signal the economic recovery has accelerated. They say operation rates of machinery in provinces such as Sichuan and Hainan led gains among other regions. Meanwhile, a piece by the Securities Times warns of a risk of chasing gold prices in the short term. Spot gold prices rallied this month near those record highs as investors bet on the possibility possibility of Fed rate cuts this year. Meanwhile, this one's kind of making the rounds, right? We talked a little bit briefly about this this week, but on Chinese social media, beverage giant Nongfu Spring has been facing blowback from some users questioning its allegiance to China and perceived links to Japan. Let's get to our Asia politics and government correspondent Rebecca Chung Wilkins. She has more on the story. What's going on? Rebecca. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. I mean, this story has really caught my eye because I think it speaks so acutely to some of the challenges that even China's domestic giants like Nongfu face when it comes to navigating this landscape of increasing political uh, correctness under President Xi Jinping. And so essentially, this was all triggered 
period when the founder of Nongfu Springs main rival Wahaha passed away in late February and that sort of sparked these unfavorable comparisons between these two founders uh, between links apparently but with the US uh, by Zhong, uh, Zhong Shan Shan the founder of Nongfu Springs son and that's had quite a tangible impact on the stocks that we've seen so far it has become one of the worst performers on the HSCEI since that date as you can see here we also had about three billion US dollars lost in market cap since the passing of Zong now the stock has dropped about five percent over that period even as the bulk of its peers have actually seen improvements yeah and, and the, the comments you're getting on social media we were talking about it earlier this week I mean they're even like what throwing Nongfu spring water down the drain and, and the like. What are you seeing, Rebecca? Yeah, let's dig a little bit deeper because some of it is apparently quite far fetched. We had even some users holding up the red uh, bottle cap of Nongfu against a white A4, saying it looked like the Japanese flag. And a lot of commentators drawing these comparisons apparently between the supposedly Japanese design elements of the bottle, inspired, they say, by the architecture, by decorations from Japan. And as you say, we've also had this spate of videos of people pouring away their Nongfu spring uh, products down the toilet or emptying the fridges of all of these products too and oh. also these calls for boycotts. Yeah um, it's very interesting. H have we heard any response from, from the founder at all? What are they yeah. saying? Yeah, so Zhong Shan Shan came out quite early on with a statement um, and that sort of reiterated that he and the founder of Wahaha had put their sort of competitive spirit behind them, that he had respect for Zhong, but it really didn't do much to try and stem some of that uh, uh, debate online. We also did see Hu Xi Jin, who is a sort of prominent uh, commentator online, uh, former editor of the state broadcast Global Times saying that Chinese people need to adjust their expectations for entrepreneurs like this, that they cannot expect them to be saints and that they have to sort of be more realistic. Um, but all of this is to say that this whole event really sort of jars somewhat, I think, for some of this push that Beijing is trying to make. I mean, it is precisely these domestic giants like Nongfu that Beijing is hoping is going to actually lift them out some of the slower economic growth that they are in. All right. Uh, it's certainly a talker. Rebecca, thank you. Rebecca Chung Wilkins, our age of politics and government correspondent on, of course, this latest when it comes to Nongfu Spring and really all the controversy around that story. Take a look at what it comes to markets, though. Obviously, we're taking watching very closely what goes on with the, the oil plays and the like. And, and energy stocks are certainly one of the key outperformers here today. China oil fuel services up some three and a half percent. Overall, though, we're waiting for those Rango talks out of Japan. This is Bloomberg.